Thank you for joining us. It is the common good. If there was ever a time to worry about the common good, to focus on the common good, it is now. A couple of extraordinarily tragic landmarks, if you will. 100,000 Americans now confirmed it. At least 100,000 have died in this pandemic. And also, we now know at least 40 million Americans are unemployed. Latest data in terms of claims for unemployment insurance, new claims for unemployment insurance, puts the total above 40 million, and that is probably an understated figure. And in the midst of all of this, we also have police brutality in Minneapolis, as we have had police brutality elsewhere around this country. We'll be talking about all of this and much more. I just wanted to say a few words, though, about leadership and contrast leadership with what we have now in the White House. Donald Trump is not talking about 100,000 Americans having died. Donald Trump is saying absolutely nothing about 40 million Americans unemployed. Donald Trump has not commented on the police brutality, the killing in Minneapolis, and the anger, justifiably, of many people in Minneapolis and elsewhere. Donald Trump, all he has done, basically, besides golfing and watching television, is he's been tweeting. And he's been trying to change the subject away from all of this because he knows that all of this is something that he, if anything, has made worse. He certainly doesn't have any positive response. He wants to be reelected, so he's changing the subject. He's saying that mail-in ballots, absentee ballots, are bad things, are prone to fraud. In fact, he says that they are necessarily fraudulent. He wants to condemn any governor, particularly in California, Gavin Newsom, uh, for expanding mail-in ballots. Says that actually it is going to be leading to more fraud. In fact, he said it was the equivalent of fraud. Mail-in ballots are fraudulent, he says. And he tweeted, not only is that false, we know that there is absolutely no evidence supporting that statement. And indeed, California is registering and sending the mail-in ballots only to registered voters. Five states vote entirely by mail. All states have some form of mail-in voting. And if the pandemic continues through November, some people are going to need to have mail-in voting in order to exercise their right to vote. Interestingly, Twitter responded to Trump's tweets by putting a warning on them for the first time. This is significant. Now, the warning was not very big. It wasn't a big deal. But it said, Twitter said, get the facts about mail-in voting. Now, you could misinterpret that, obviously, if you are a Trump follower or if you are somebody inclined to being a Trump follower. That might actually lead you to think that maybe there was something to worry about with mail-in voting. But I think that Twitter's, in fact, it's clear, Twitter's intent was to flag some of Trump's more blatant tweets. This is the first time social media has done that. Trump responded in the only way Trump knows how to respond, with a threat. Trump is threatening legislation, but he's in the immediate terms threatening an executive order to punish Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, and it all centers, and you'll be hearing much more about this, on Section 230 of the Communications Act, which prevents liability, which gives platforms like Twitter and Facebook protection against libel suits. And he's going to try, through executive order, to remove that protection probably today. Uh, that is illegal. Twitter under the First Amendment and under the Communications Act has every right to monitor what is going on and to issue corrections or at the very least issue warnings. But as this plays out, 
the important point to keep in mind is that Trump's entire campaign is based on his tweets and on deception and on divisiveness. He is not dealing with the coronavirus. He's not dealing with the economic crisis. He's not dealing with anything else. He's certainly not dealing with police violence and brutality. Donald Trump wants to shape a campaign around the way he has shaped his entire presidency, which is negatives, which is stories, ridicule, put downs, anything he can use against anybody who opposes him or criticizes him. So the mere fact that Twitter stood up, even a modest standing up like this, even a minuscule standing up like this is important. Facebook, interestingly, and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook criticized Twitter, saying that Twitter should not ever get involved in content. Zuckerberg is wrong. Zuckerberg is the irresponsible party here. Zuckerberg is playing into Trump just as he played into the Russians in 2016. He is the one who deserves condemnation, along with Donald Trump. Now, back to the economy. We're going to be talking about the economy today. We're also going to be talking about George Floyd and police brutality in Minneapolis and elsewhere. Uh, but I also want to just mention a new piece of information, economic information, as a way of introducing my colleague, Katie Milne. And that is that millennials are taking a particular beating in not only this economy, but the data that I've just seen show that millennials, young people who are, were born in the 1980s, have never actually had in their adult lives a good economy. They have never had the benefits of a good economy, and yet many have the burdens of student debt and many other problems, and obviously they are all suffering under this particular pandemic and the worst economy since the Great Depression. Katie, with that upbeat introduction, let me bring you in. You are our resident millennial, perennial millennial. Uh, just tell me, I, I, just a little bit, in terms of your colleagues, your friends, your acquaintances, people you know in your peer groups, what's going on? I mean, how are people coping? Um, not well by any means. I think the majority of my friends right now are on unemployment and just trying to get by. And a lot of my friends who are younger than me just graduated college as well into a an uncertain jobs market with no certainty or predictions about their future. So it's in, an incredibly stressful time for, for every generation. But the fact that millennials haven't been able to gain a foothold in a strong economy from the oldest millennials to the youngest ones. I mean, our entire generation that, you know, is pretty wide reaching, hasn't ever experienced a, thr a real thriving economy. It, it's just, it's horrible. And it's a very stressful time. You know, interestingly, millennial, millennials uh, have no savings. I mean, the average, the typical millennial has almost no savings. Uh, millennials also have college debt, as I mentioned. Uh, millennials uh, don't are, are renters for the most part. And the data show that half the states are actually removing over the next several weeks any restrictions that they had imposed during this pandemic on collecting rent, on people really allowing people to be late uh, which means that there are going to be a lot of millennials as well as many poor people, uh, many people of color, uh, many working class people who are going to be losing their place to live, their habitat, their housing uh, over the next several weeks. I mean, this is a big, big deal, obviously. Yeah, it really is. It floors me that all of this temporary relief that Congress passed back in March is set to expire in the coming months. As you mentioned, the temporary eviction moratoriums are going to be lifted in about half the states. How can you evict someone, a family that's lost their income or their job? How can you evict someone, put them out onto the streets in the middle of a pandemic when the best way to stop the spread of the virus is to stay home? And those expanded unemployment benefits, that extra $600 a week, people are finally starting to get those benefits because there's a massive backlog with these underfunded, understaffed state unemployment benefit offices. But those 
um, that expansion is set to expire at the end of July. And Republicans have made it very, very clear that there's absolutely no chance that those will be renewed. And it is just so I just am I'm at a loss for words that our government and our leaders are nowhere to be found when we're barreling towards an economic crisis and they just don't care. So what are your thoughts on that? What is going to happen if the government doesn't pass more relief and what kind of relief do we need to get to Americans right now? Well, Katie, Mitch McConnell uh, has left mm -hmm. town. The Senate has closed down, basically taken a recess. Uh, but there we have the House. The Democratic House did pass three trillion dollars of relief. One trillion was for state and local governments. State governments are running out of money. They are on the, uh, you know, they are on the front lines in terms of this pandemic and also the economic crisis. Uh, and you, the last thing you want to do is put states and locales into the position of austerity. I mean, hmm. you want them to be able to spend money to stimulate the economy uh, and not to do what they need, not to provide states and locales the money they need is going to hurt people and it's going to make it harder to restart the economy. Uh, the other thing that the Congress, Republicans, Mitch McConnell doesn't want to do uh, is to provide any additional relief whatsoever. I mean, even to individuals, uh, he doesn't want to reform or change the paycheck protection. Uh, they, uh, all they want to do is provide some sort of liability relief for businesses so that nobody can sue a business because they have got uh, the COVID-19. Nobody who is out there now, as businesses open, the last thing you want is for businesses to feel completely free to subject their employees to this virus what you want to do is provide every incentive for businesses to provide protective equipment and gear and masks and the you know at least six foot of leeway for people in terms of social distancing but by getting rid of all of the liability that businesses might face in failing to do that which is what mitch mcconnell and the republicans want you're inviting even more of a disaster so that's where we are katie i wish i could be more positive about it uh, Long-term economic forecast, nobody knows, but I can tell you that if you don't give money to the states, if you don't actually provide additional funding for individuals, if Donald Trump succeeds in making uh, uh, even, uh, even uh, uh, our relations with China worse than they are now, so there's less trade with China, less exports to China, uh, we are going to be in a deeper and deeper economic crisis that is going to last for not just months, but perhaps a year or more. Wow, so the outlook's great is what I'm hearing pretty much. Um, so I'm curious to know, how does this, so do you think we're gonna, we're gonna hit a recession, an active recession soon? Well, I think we're already in a recession. I mean, we're we're, already we'll in. have the data. Uh, officially, a recession is when you have two economic quarters when mm -hmm. the economy shrinks. Uh, and it's pretty clear that we are now in that kind of a dynamic. The economy is shrinking, however you measure it. Uh, the real question is, uh, are we going to find ourselves in this for three quarters or for four quarters? And how long is this going to last? Uh, but, uh, you know, the biggest, the people who are suffering the most, I mean, everybody's suffering, almost mm. everybody, not in the billionaires, obviously, but the people who are suffering the most are people who are poor or people of color, uh, people who are lower middle class and working class. It is really taking a, the whole pandemic and the economic crisis are taking a, taking it out on the most vulnerable people in our society. Yeah, it is the, everything that's happened this week with George Floyd, I mean, we all saw that horrific video that went viral and I just find it so uniquely and horribly American that in the middle of a pandemic that is already disproportionately harming African-American communities, we're forced out into the streets to protest yet another another unjust police killing. I mean, it's just, in what other country does this happen? You know, it is just this collective trauma that is being underwent by the black communities right now. I just, I, I have no words. It is so horrible. And the thing that 
is just so frustrating is how these protesters in Minneapolis were met with more violence, with more state violence, with the tear gassing. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic that is for a respiratory illness, you're firing tear gas at your own citizens. I mean, what is going on here? And I just think back to barely a month ago, when all of these white protesters who were demanding and advocating for their right to get a haircut, they can storm state capitals loaded up with AR-15s decked out in Confederate regalia, and they're met with just peaceful stoicism from all of these police officers, just no pushback at all. They can yell at in the faces of these officers, they can spit at them, and there's no pushback at all. And then as soon as protesters take to the streets to advocate for racial justice and to mourn this tragic loss in their community, they're met with more violence. I mean, it is just mind blowing that this is happening right now. Well, uh, racism uh, is pretty endemic, uh, sadly, mm -hmm. in police departments around the country. Uh, and this is not new, Katie, as you know, we've yeah. had a history of police brutality for years. And every time we have a blue ribbon commission that reports on reforms and this department or that department, or another department is going to be monitored and they're going to be new people in minneapolis had a, a whole you know minneapolis has had uh, racist uh, charges and racist actions in that police department for years uh, and uh, even the pro the person who is now the chief of police was one of the people who had charged the department with being racist uh, it still happens i mean it's 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 you know it, it's it's i i share your 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 frustration and coming at a time of a pandemic and an economic crisis when people of color are already already uh, bearing the brunt of the burden I, this is this is beyond uh, beyond the pale i i want to just uh, play for you i don't know if you saw it this is a, i was very moved by this clip mm. it's a young man kedron bryant uh, who uh, just speaks and sings very much from his heart uh, let's see if we can listen, if it's ready. I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stand Oh, but when I look around And I see what's being done to my kind Every day I'm being hung Kedron Bryant, you know, I, I, I just find that so moving, Katie, uh, mm. because uh, here's a young person uh, with his entire life in front of him, uh, and he faces this triple barrel problem. It's not just disproportionate pandemic burden and disproportionate economic burden. It is also uh, a, a, a government uh, emblemized and, and represented by a police department that is that is not for them, for him. Uh, he's growing up with an understanding that our system of justice uh, is not working, is not working, is fundamentally uh, and inextricably broken. Uh, so the question is, how do we reform? I mean, it, it, may be, it may seem silly to even talk about reform of our economy, our politics, our uh, health system, uh, and our police system at a time like this. Uh, but all of these systems interact. All of these systems are misfiring, misfunctioning, are letting our people down. Uh, we entitled this series, The Common Good, because that seems to be the thing that's missing, a sense of mm -hmm. commonality uh, of what we used to be able to. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna look at the past through rose colored glasses because of course there was a lot of racism and there was a lot of, of failure, uh, but at least we were striving toward a country of equal opportunity and sharing prosperity and having a government that cared about its people uh, and was responding to pandemics or health crises. Uh, right now, it just seems like we have nothing, nothing. Where did it go? Where did the common good disappear to? I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this week, has is just has just been an avalanche of, of trauma and tragic loss and our, our leaders are nowhere to be found i mean mitch mcconnell brought the senate back into re out of recess so that he could confirm more of trump's hyperpartisan right-wing judges and as soon as that as soon as he got that done he skipped town i mean trump is tweeting 
about cons tweeting conspiracy theories and yelling at Twitter and claiming he's being censored and as the death toll reaches 100,000 and our citizens are getting tear gassed in the streets. I mean, it is just, it is really hard to look forward and have any iota of hopefulness or any any joy, but at least for me, I know this week has really, it's made me angry and frustrated, but in a way where I'm just more determined to fight than ever. And you know, the election is coming up in five months and it's hard to see the connection between that and, and things that are happening right now, but it is really, I mean, you've said it before, this is the most consequential election of your lifetime and it's just five months away. So I think, from now until then, all of us have to really buckle down and, and fight because this, what happens on November 3rd, 2020 is going to have implications for, for decades to come. Well, as, as bad as it seems, Katie, right now, uh, I can assure you that it could get worse, but it will get better. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I say that as somebody who has lived through a lot of bad times, uh, when I graduated from college, you know, we were in the midst of a Vietnam War. Uh, I lost some very, very dear friends. Uh, the cities were in, were burning because Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Most of our hopes were literally going up in flames. And then at the end of that year, who is elected president? But Richard Nixon. You know, I thought it could not get worse, uh, but the country is resilient. I mean, when I think about what has happened uh, over just the last few years in terms of uh, gay rights uh, and the right of people for equal marriage rights, when I think of a black man being elected president in 2008, which I thought would never happen, uh, when I think of the composition of the House of Representatives after the 2018 midterms and all of the young people and women and people of color uh, who are now in positions of responsibility in America. Uh, when I think about my own students who of all the 40 years of teaching I've, I've done uh, represent uh, and constitute to me the most dedicated and committed group of young people I've had the privilege of teaching, committed to changing this country, reforming the country. Uh, when I think of all of that, uh, I you know, I, I understand this is a bad time, but I am optimistic, fundamentally optimistic about the future. Well, that makes one of us. Um, no, just kidding. As I said, <laughs> I'm I'm right there with you. And the, the everything that has been so horrible this week has just made me more determined than ever. And on your more positive note, you have a small update for our dedicated viewers and followers. Would you like to let them know? Um, oh, yeah. what before, we have planned? Be, absolutely. Before we end, we're going to take a small hiatus with regard to the common good, uh, which gives us the opportunity to uh, do more videos and also more posting and figure out how the common good and other of our uh, activities can be made even more useful to you uh, as we approach, as Katie said, uh, this this mark, this five month mark be before the most consequential election uh, in our lifetimes, uh, we wanna be able to do even more of what we have done before. And that is to equip you, our viewers, our followers, uh, our subscribers uh, with the information and analysis and frameworks uh, and data and videos and graphics and all kinds of things that you need in order to make the case that needs to be made about social justice, about the necessity of sharing our prosperity, once again, making an economy that works for everyone, not just an oligarchy, making sure that our democracy is a democracy that is robust and not one in which votes are suppressed and not only are votes suppressed, but votes are actually meaningless. We want to make sure that all of you have what you need. Uh, on Monday, I do my Monday live broadcasts. I'll continue to be doing that, obviously, uh, in addition to the videos and everything else we're doing. Uh, and uh, we're a small group. Uh, I mean, Katie mm -hmm. and I and three others, basically we do it all. Uh, I don't know how we do it, Katie. You, you don't, you, in fact, you should, you should get back to work. You shouldn't actually be <laughs> spending your time on this. Uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody knows how much I appreciate your work, Katie, 
and they appreciate it, and I appreciate the work of my colleagues. But I also am very, very thankful for all of you who follow us and subscribe and have supported us uh, because the most important five months, six months in front of us uh, really will determine the fate of this nation and maybe the world. So, uh, Katie, um, I hope uh, again we're going to we're in tough times. Uh, they could not be tougher, but we will get out of this. Our resilience and our common good will prevail. Thank you all.